I want to encourage you to start bringing Bibles to churches. Yeah. Now, the reason why you do that is because it's a prophetic act. I remember one time I was assigned to a church where I was a worship leader. And I was assigned to that church, and the pastor, God bless him, he really only had one sermon, and, he, and, and then he re-preached it every week. And we were, we were in an auto over an auto body shop. We called it the upper room. We're really optimistic. Uh, Chris, it was an auto body shop. And, uh, and when we were there, he preached at one sermon, and I was complaining to the Lord. I said, I know you sent me here because I lead the worship. But my gosh, Lord, what am I going to do? The pastor's just like, you know, he goes for an hour. He's not saying anything. It's the same thing he always says. The Lord said, well, two things. One, start praying for him instead of complaining. And secondly, if you brought a journal or a notebook to church with a pen, maybe your ear would be tuned with expectation to hear something. And instead of complaining and being bored, you'd hear from me. Well, unusual things start happening. The pastor's preaching gradually got better and better and better, but God was talking to me while he was preaching. And he would say something, and the Lord would add to me an insight, like an angel sitting there and say, and hit me in the arm and go, and add, and, and I add a note to it. I got more meat out of his sermons because I started praying for him and I started writing things down. Here's the revelation. The last day's move of God, Wigglesworth said it, but I think it makes a lot of sense. The last day's move of God will be I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That, that move of God is on the horizon here. As much as you're talking about end times, it's looking dark out there, the rapture's any minute, oh, America's in big trouble, the Antichrist, the market. Listen, I could, I could tell you things that would raise the hair on the back of your neck, but I'm not here to give you anxiety. I'm here to edify you. But while we're talking about anxiety, here's one. Recently, uh, your, your congressman, because we do not call our congressmen, and they don't know we exist, uh, they end up being influenced by lobbyists more than by people that get them elected. So they voted to endorse the World Health Organization having special powers over you. This is great, since the World Health Organization is largely under the influence of communist China, which basically puts China in charge of your health, which wouldn't be a problem if you believe that every single virus that hits the earth is coming up because of global warming. Maybe you think it comes out of a bioweapons lab. And then if it comes out of a lab, that means it's man-made. And if it's man-made, that means men are still making them. So when that virus comes out, how do you know that virus isn't being launched on humanity in order to lock down humanity, in order to control humanity? Well, then they got this centralized digital currency they also approved. Well, this is a wonderful novelty. Let's just put a couple of these ideas together. You got your virus launched by a bioweapons lab. You got a World Health Organization, not a national organization that protects your rights as an American, but a global order that locks down the whole globe. But um, do not be concerned because if there's an economic collapse as a result of another prolonged plague, then they're going to reboot the system with a centralized digital currency. That means get rid of your cash, get rid of your autonomy, your money, spend your money on what you want. It's your business. You will be given a credit score. Now they have to have a means of being able to control that credit score. And get, in other words, you're going to be working with a credit card. Well, what's a good way of uh, being able to make sure that you're tracked in the proper use of credit cards? Because after all, you know, we have problems with uh, you know, people that could be coming through to your border that are not authorized or terrorism. So the urge will be, we need to have law and order. So what if that centralized digital currency could be delivered in combination with a vaccine? Now you have a nanotechnology that's already got a patent on it, which could literally laser tag your forehead that would enable you to do it buying and selling without having to worry about having to carry around currency. Not to mention that little digital mark can track you wherever you go. Now, if you go to this church and you're not supposed to be at this church because you're supposed to be going someplace else where you're being properly educated on the Bible, you actually could find that your credit score goes down and your ability to use a bus, transportation, buy gas. In other words, there's ways they can kind of corral you into right behavior. Are, are you getting freaked out yet? Yeah, this is what happens. When the devil has unfettered access to mankind because he doesn't meet resistance. Amen. So, far, just about, you want me, to, want me to get another microphone? No, side, when I'm on what side? When I'm on this side, it works? Well, that's a good observation. 
So evidently you guys are okay over here. It's these people I'm having a problem. I'm trying. The visitors are all over there, so I'm trying to reach out to them. All right, so, so just catch this now. All that. All right, give me a handheld. Give me a handheld. This happens. This happens. It's a low-level devil. Check, check, check. Well, you know, the first century didn't have a microphone, so we'll just have to innovate. What I'm saying is if you cover the news, because I'm a news analyst and a prophet, so my job is to go explore what's going on out there. But Jesus did say that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I just want you to know what when you're praying and when you're obeying and you're doing your what seemingly little contribution, whatever it is you're doing to change the world, understand that in the aggregate, you are the firewall that is keeping everything that I'm talking about from ever happening right. And so the good news is I watch this stuff get sabotaged constantly. Just about the time when they want to do this WHO, there's a couple of Christians in a state that have one senator, like Ron Johnson, that blocks it. I mean, I watch this stuff. So in one sense, I get traumatized more than the average person, and I get happier more than the average because I just watch God send angels intercept devils all the time. And so, and from my perspective, it's a rather exciting thing. But I would suggest to you something, and I want you all to really think earnestly about this. And, and Hal and Cheryl, I'm glad you're here for this, because there's two things that have to change in the prayer realm. We're not winning the battle over America yet. So regardless of all the positive prophecies you'll hear from my prophetic friends, we're not winning it. I don't want you apathetic. I don't want you sitting back and, and thinking it's all going to work out all right, or you're just going to get rapture airlifted out. The church is on the front lines, not only keeping the devil from succeeding with his digital current, or with his, uh, interesting today. Hold it high, hold, don't cover the antenna. Perhaps if I had it digitally implanted in my forehead. I'm gonna talk to Elon Musk about a neural link, maybe. The church is the impediment to the devil's desire in Phoenix. The church is the resistance on the earth. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the kinds of praying that we're doing is gonna to have to go up another level. Let me just release this to you. I only knew one church specifically, I'm sure there are others, but I know one church in history where a church bound the principality over the territory. And when they bound it, the spirit was broken and it affected the entire nation. And it happened for about 10 years. And it was in Uppsala, Sweden, a place called Uppsala, Sweden, with uh, Ulf Ekman. And it literally transformed the, the nation of Sweden for about a decade. And it was the hot spot in Europe. But one of the things they did was they learned how to pray in the spirit. See, if you pray in English, or you pray in Spanish, or you pray in your native tongue, you pray certain prayers that you know get answered a certain way. But what happens if you don't know how to pray? Do we really know how to pray for America? Do we really? If you think you know, you know not yet that you don't really know how to pray. That's what the Bible says. We know not how to pray. Therefore, the Spirit himself makes intercession through us. And what I'm dropping on all of you, I recognize we got some young people, new believers, old believers. I'm dropping it on the church as a word. If you will host the Holy Ghost, even before we come here in the next uh, couple of weeks, and you break through to a new realm of praying in tongues. I'm talking about praying strong in the spirit. If you will break out in stronger intercession, then you're going to begin to access what the Bible calls an apostolic realm of spiritual authority. What has been released to the church right now is prophets wandering around, kind of hovering around, looking for what God's doing, but they're kind of stuck. There, well, most of us get stuck in a predicting political events, which is a terrible thing because our primary gift isn't supposed to be prognosticating the outcome of World Series or elections. Our job is to help you get clear on what you're called to do. But if we keep getting sh pushed over here by the, by the crowd, faith is over here and people aren't pulling. What you do personally is more important than what happens to Donald Trump. 
because he'll stand before Jesus and account for himself. You're not going to account for him. You're going to account for you. But the apostolic is missing. The apostolic is that final piece in the governing structure of the ecclesia, the New Testament church. First apostles, second early prophets, thirdly teachers. Once that final piece gets stuck in there, and there's no reason why your church, it doesn't matter what age you are, you can be apostolic as a church or as a ministry the moment that you become a governing force. So the governing power in the body of Christ is a combination punch. It's apostles, prophets, teachers coming together, and then the pastor teacher raises up a flock that is moving under that. And I'm telling you, Phoenix needs a different level of prayer in the Holy Ghost, praying into an apostolic anointing that brings the government of God over Phoenix, unifying the leadership. And we could see that. I mean, I saw it yesterday. I think we could do like one or two, because I got the business guys. I got the politicians. I've got Mar-a-Lago and the, and the frontline people. And then we've got the, the great, we just never convened them. And I just started realizing the Courage Tour, which is what we're doing, is because there's 3,143 counties in the United States, and the Lord showed us 19 are going to determine the future of America. 19. Where are they? They're in seven areas called battleground states. I didn't know that there were spiritual battleground states until God said to me, why do you think they're called battleground states? Because there's a battle in the atmosphere over who's going to govern the territory. And if my people aren't praying strong in the spirit, if we don't have apostles and prophets in the territory, then demons control the territory and the minds of people are under the influence of devils. 19 counties in seven states. I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord said, there's 19 counties because guess why they're, why they're key counties? Because there's enough Christians in the counties to shift the atmosphere, but they don't show up. America's future is in 19 counties where Christians are under a cloud of apathy and distraction. Lord said, you're going. You're going to go with Mario, and Mario's going to do signs and wonders to do his things, a breakthrough in the supernatural. You're going to be bringing a prophetic alignment, apostolic alignment with the business, the politicians, the churches, and the mama bears. Because the moms instinctively know that their little boys are being threatened by a very calculated cunning that is trying to seduce them at the age of 11, 12, or 13 into thinking that they need to chop off their sex organs in order to change their gender. If you don't think that's the agenda, you're, you're asleep at the switch. It's exactly what's going on in the school system right now. So the mama bears have a God-given wiring to fight it. So I'm working with Lou Engel and Jenny Donnelly. We're working to get one million mothers. On the Day of Atonement in Washington, D.C., I've helped secure a place for one million mothers, Esthers and Mordecais, to cry out to God for mercy on America on the Day of Atonement, which is about three or four weeks before the nation's election decides what happens. We're working to get a million Esthers and Mordecais up there to cry out to God. So you're living in a very exciting times. Now, what makes this church interesting I personally was going to come here because of my own liking of the pastors and you people. But then I sent my staff the location. They said, what's the address of the church? Come to find out. You are right smack dab in striking distance of one of those 19 county areas in Maricopa. Your church is located right in the epicenter of the battle for America. There's four key states. Arizona's one of them. Maricopa's the key county. And here you are. Then I realized the reason I'm here is it may seem strange. I'm here to save America through your church. So it's more than just going to our little meeting when we come to your town and put up our tent. It's about owning the fact that I came all the way here as an ambassador, putting this thing on. The Courage Tour is my creation. The evening is Mario's evangelism. I'm hooking up to him because the one-two punch can change the territory. The evangelist alone will spark a little revival, and it'll last a little while, and a bunch of souls will get saved, and it's bloop, then he's off to the next city. But you do this thing right, you have a sustained chain reaction. I'm here to announce to you that those 19 counties are going to be impacted because there's 19 churches i got to find, and you're the first one. Yeah. Now, I do want to edify you with uh, another revelation here. you got to change the way you pray. Hal and Cheryl, I'm serious about this. 
Praying strong in the Spirit is the only way we're going to do it because God wants you to pray certain things in your tongues that your head doesn't know. And when you pray that way, though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I have not love, it doesn't profit me. Well, let's forget about the love for a minute and look at the first part. Do you know it's possible to speak in angel tongues? Let me say it again. Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, what does it profit me? We all focus. I've done this verse myself over weddings. I used to pastor. Oh, the first Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind. The Lord one day had me rewind the tape, said, read about the angel tongues. I said, Ooh, where's angel tongues? Read it. I'll tell you, God is not as religious as we are. He's wild. I started looking at it. Lord said, though I speak with the tongues of angels, stop. Why don't you speak with the tongues of angels? I said, well, I don't know how to do it. The Lord says, that's not true. When you pray strong in the Spirit, you're praying prayers that the Holy Ghost is giving you. You're not talking to me. You don't have to shout at me. But there's a time when a holy travail comes over you. You're not doing that to persuade me. You're doing that to release something in the Spirit realm. You guys are staring at me funny. This must be good. So I said, well, when am I praying, speaking in tongues of angels? The Lord said, when you pray strong in the commanding utterances of the Spirit. I thought about it. I thought, well, I always thought it was kind of strange. Sometimes I'm praying in my nice little Mediterranean tongues. Kind of, you know, Spanish, Caribbean, whatever. I once was praying in tongues next to a guy who leaned over me and said, who, what part of Jordan are you from? I said, I'm not from Jordan. He said, you're speaking Jordanian. I said, I I'm sorry. I'm praying in tongues. <laughs> he said, would you like to know what you're saying? I said, I sure would. <laughs> I am a God that delights to build the buildings. And then I realized, he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. You know what the word edify means? It comes from the root word edif edifice. It means God delights to build a building on the inside of you to house a new level of revelation and power. God delights to build a new building in this church for a new dimension of revelation and power. You are willing to be a kind little mercy church opening yourself up to whoever is hurt and whoever needs pastoral care and love and you are willing to be evangelists. God said that's the right heart. But now I'm going to cause you to take more territory. I'm going to take you from the sheep folds where you're hanging out with a few sheep. And I'm going to cause you to take down the Goliath that is stalking your territory. Oh, I don't hear a lot of enthusiasm over that one, but that's where the fun is. It's where David got promoted from one mountain, the shepherd mountain, in his house with his family ministry, with Jesse over the governing affairs of Mount Zion and Saul's house. Well, I'm here to tell you, God wants you to take your assignment seriously. Let me give you a couple of wild revelations from the Bible. This book is going to become a new book for us. Praying in the tongues of men and angels. How many of you would like to be able to do that? See, when you pray in the tongues of angels, you're authorized. How many of you know you've got angels assigned to you? Well, I don't know if you know this yet, but there are angels assigned to you. And a lot of people think those angels are there for just protecting you. Well, most Christians aren't living that dangerous a life. They need divine protection. <laughs> Primarily, your angel's there to set you up for the divine appointments that progress you towards the blueprint of God for your life. Amen. When you walk by faith and you go on the great adventure and you do what God calls you to do and you get into the word, you get into praying and you live bold, your angel goes to work. And your angel creates appointments. Primarily, angels set things up. Angels are set up men. They set you up for the assignment, for the divine appointments, for the revelation, for the connection that you need to get the job done. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Now, how does your angel sometimes know? Well, I'm sure they're all dispatched and administrated by other angels. They're under supervision. There's also, well, I guess the Holy Spirit's talking directly to the angels in charge. The angels are going down the train, train of command. But I got another methodology for you. What am I doing? I'm speaking in the tongues of men and of angels. What I'm telling you is sometimes you don't know if you're speaking in the Holy Ghost. 
to the Lord or whether you're speaking to edify or if you're actually speaking to the spirit realm. But I'll tell you this, if you'll take this teaching seriously and start to stir yourself up to pray fervently in the Holy Ghost and pray in the unknown tongue and let God take you somewhere, you'll start giving authoritative utterances into the spirit realm and the angels that are around there will actually hear the instructions God's giving them. And you don't know exactly what they are because it's by faith. Does that make sense to you? I know you're all staring at me funny, but we're late in the war in America and we got to pick up the pace. Praying your nice little bless me prayers and help this guy or that guy get elected isn't going to cut it. We have to go into the realms of travail. We have to go into the realms of strong praying in the Holy Ghost. We have to cast out some devils, cast down some principalities and invade with some evangelism. How's that sound? Well, it's anything but boring, I'll promise you that. It'll make for an exciting life. It's, it's, if you, re- you don't really want to live a normal life. You want to live an exciting, this book is an exciting book. Written for people that are living an exciting life. Let me give you a couple of mind-blowing facts about this time of year, the resurrection. This time of year, Passover. Let's just take a look. I'm going to give you two or three revelations from the Word because I really want you to have a hunger and a thirst for the Word. Last night I went out for a barbecue with your pastor and his nine-year-old son. I don't know what I was thinking, but I ate barbecue and barbecue sauce, and I I was laying in bed around 1 a.m., and I was so overpowered by thirst because of the salt, I guess, in in the barbecue. I had to get up and go down to the front desk and round around and pull a manager out from the back because I felt guilty ripping off all their water bottles, and nobody would, I couldn't pay for them because nobody was up. Went and got a manager in a back office. He had headphones on. I didn't want to start him like I was breaking in. I go, hey, I got all these water bottles. He goes, okay, what room? I give him my room number and take off. I'm drinking that water, and I, I felt like the Lord was saying, I want my people thirsty for divine revelation. And the only way you'll get that is if you actually start getting some discoveries in the Bible about some hidden nuggets, and you realize maybe you're, maybe you're not reading because you aren't aware that God wants to have a conversation with you out of this book. It's the Word and the Spirit is coming together with this outpouring. There's an end time outpouring. It'll operate for you according to the level of Word you got on the inside of you. So it's not enough just to have a lot of power. If you don't have a lot of Word, you're not going to go anywhere. Let's start with one wild revelation right now. And this is Matthew chapter 27. Do you know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he wasn't the only one that was raised from the dead? This is crazy. You go to Matthew chapter 27. Verse 52, hallelujah, 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 glory to God. Matthew 27, 52. Now check this out. It says here, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and came out of the graves after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. There was an earthquake that happens, and read what it says. I want you to say this. The graves were open, and many bodies, many bodies of the saints arose. Now, here's the interesting fact. What was God doing? Well, they came out into the holy city and appeared to many. My premise is this, that when Jesus rose, he's what we call the first fruits, the first fruits of the resurrection. When he, came, when he came out of the tomb, it was at the same time, uh, simultaneous when there's priests supposed to be waving this first sheaves of the new harvest. Jesus came out, but he didn't come out alone. He came out with the evidence that the resurrection had happened. And evidently, the people that had died, think about this, were known by the people in the city because that was the testimony that a resurrection is happening. Because it's like, hey, isn't that your uncle? I think I saw your mother. I thought I saw your dad. Yeah, I saw him too. He's wandering down the marketplace. Oh, that was so weird. What was? And I can't find him now. I thought he was dead. He is dead. They go to the grave. It's split open. So the resurrection was, everyone was talking about dead people walking. And in the middle of it, the one who just got tried and rejected as Messiah, they're claiming he's risen from the dead. So there was many that were raised from the dead when Jesus came out of the tomb. The second really interesting thing to me that isn't, isn't talked about enough is I want you to go to uh, John's Gospel. I didn't even think I wrote this down. John chapter 19. Now check this out. As this resurrection is happening and many are coming out of the grave, in John 19, 
Joseph of Arimathea, in verse 38, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus in Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of aloes and myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as is the custom of the Jews. Now, in this place, there was crucified, where he was crucified, was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb. And no one had ever been laid there. Now, listen to me. A Jewish professor by the name of Simon Greenleaf, who founded the Harvard Law School, School for the Law, for Laws for the school, school of Harvard for Evidence. He was the founder of the School of Evidence at Harvard. A Jewish atheist took it upon himself to disprove the resurrection using the laws of evidence in his copious eight volumes of evidence and how it's to be used in a judicial case. He applied his copious abilities to debunk the Christian superstition of dead people walking. And after he applied his laws of evidence, Simon Greenleaf gave his heart to Jesus as a Jewish professor because he became convinced the laws of evidence verified rather than disproved the resurrection of Jesus. And the further he went, the more trouble he got. And here's one of the problems he unearthed. He said, wait a second. Jesus' body was there and there. He takes the, the, the record of Scripture. Jesus is a historic person. These things were written, could have been refuted because the Apostle Paul said when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was seen by 500 people at one time. Paul said, the most of whom are still alive to this day. Meaning when it was written in Corinth, there were still people living, talking about seeing Jesus resurrected. So that's what you call eyewitnesses. So now Simon Greenleaf is writing, he's running, he's running into a problem. He can't reject the scriptures as being antiquated. He can't reject the testimony as being inaccurate. So he'll prove by the scripture that it's impossible for a dead man to come to life again. And he'll prove it as a logical absurdity. But here's his problem. He comes to this verse. He says, well, 100 pounds of myrrh, aloes, a mixture. Well, technically, that's 75 pounds. You see, because they changed the uh, unit of measurement for today from Roman times. He said, however... 75 pounds of spices and oil is still a lot to wrap around a man who just went through a physical trauma. His theory is maybe Jesus recovered in the grave. Maybe he, maybe he wasn't totally dead. Maybe he was able to somehow recover. And uh, here was Simon Greenlee's problem. The way that they did the, uh, the wrapping of the dead with linen strips had he just had a pants and a suit like my kind of funeral, which is like you put on a nice suit, and there it goes, last time you'll see it. He got wrapped with linen strips from the bottom all the way up to the body, all the way up to the head where it goes around like this, and the final part is coming this way. They ran out of time. They left a hole at the top and put a napkin on top and decided they'd come back and finish the wrapping job. They put the spices in the layers of the linen. But you see, with, the myrrh, with myrrh and with ointment, you literally could put quickly the linen into a paste that has the scent and the spices with it. Where did they learn this? They learned this kind of art from 400 years in Egypt where the Egyptians were masters at being able to wrap a body up so that it didn't smell when it was decomposing. They learned it in Egypt. So if you're going to have them in a tomb, you can still smell the odor of the decaying flesh, unless you wrap the body in spices with a paste. Now here's the problem. Over the course of three days, the ointment and the spices and the linen cloth solidify. It creates a cocoon. And it's wrapped tight around the body so that you can see the contour of the entire body. Now this explains something. They come back three days later, and they're freaking out. Peter goes in with John, verse 5, chapter 20. Now read it. This is why the Word of God is so fascinating. And the Bible says in verse 4, John and Peter were both running. They both ran together, but one disciple was faster than the other. John, for some reason, puts this detail that's useless in. He says, I was faster than Peter. I always, I always beat him when we raced. 
kind of a weird relationship they have, a little competition between the brothers. So I got there first. I let Peter go in, though. He didn't beat me. And he's stooping down and looking and saw the linen clothes lying there. Now, if you did a little Greek language here, fascinating because the word of God is so inspired. The word for lying there doesn't mean laying there, like you just throw your clothes on the floor. It means to be, to be arranged in a certain order. To be arranged in a certain configuration. Now, watch this. Stooping down and looking in, and he sees the linen clothes lying there. He didn't go in. That's John. Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around the head not lying with the linen clothes but folded together by a place by itself. And when the other disciple came into the tomb first, he went in also and saw and believed. Well, why would you believe? Just because the guy left his clothes there. I mean, how do you know someone didn't rob the body and leave the clothes there? Why would you believe in a resurrection by going in and looking at clothes? Because, let's use the board here, they weren't looking at clothes folded up like if you were going to a hotel room and checking out the closet. Here's what they were looking at. The face open, the body. They literally saw the linen strips all there. What they looked at was a human cocoon like a cast. And when they looked inside, there was no body. That's why they believed. Does that make sense to you now? Why would they believe? Because they saw something. So here's Simon Greenleaf has a problem. He says, I believe a swoon theory is possible. I believe this man, Jesus, certainly did exist. And certainly there were people that believed he was resurrected from the dead. He had eyewitness accounts of being seen. His problem was, the only way with Roman guards present to pull this off would be to move fast. And to move fast, you'd have to cut this cast off from the bottom to the top, break it open like a lobster shell, get the corpse out, throw it over your shoulder and take off with it, and then say he's resurrected. Well, the Roman guards, these tough Roman guards, took on these handful of Galileans who were so nervous they were hiding out when Jesus showed up. And this was the little company that wouldn't fight to defend him from a mob, but suddenly had the power to overtake a Roman guard. Not likely, but even if they did, they didn't have time to suck the body out through the hole where the mouth is, which hasn't been figured out how to do. This is a bigger escape than Houdini. That's why when they went in and looked, they believed, because that's what they saw. 75 pounds of spice. That's a lot to have to unwrap yourself from while you're traumatized with your feet and your back pierced and your, 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 your chest cut open. And you're going you're gonna to pull out from all that, overpower the guards, roll a stone away, and then convince your friends 24 hours later that you're supernaturally resurrected without a week off to recover? Greenleaf... He's writing the, he's saying, oh my gosh, he's having a panic attack because he's realizing the laws of evidence are telling him something must have happened there that is inexplicable because the evidence is compounding. I'll give you another fact that I think is wild in the resurrection. John chapter 20, keep on reading. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus runs into Mary at the tomb. She's trying to figure out what they do with the body. She's looking at the empty cocoon. Have you taken him? What do you do? Where's his body? They're still trying to find a dead body. And Jesus says to her, verse 17, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. Stop. Really wild thought. You think that Jesus says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus kind of dies. Angels carry him up to the bosom of the father. He's in heaven. And then for three days he waits and he comes down and gets his body. That's not what happened. Jesus actually comes on the third day, comes out to where the tomb is. Stone is rolled away. He's standing there. He's standing there. He says, I have not yet gone up. Well, what's that all about? Then I run into this wild verse. It's from uh, Ephesians 4, verse 10. Stop clinging to me, Mary. I haven't yet ascended. I'm saying, well, where was he? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Is the word of God interesting or what? 
Ephesians chapter 4, it says here in verse 8, Therefore he says when he ascended, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Somehow when he ascended, he took something prisoner and brought it with him. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But he also first descended. Oh, he that ascended first descended. In other words, he first went down. Then three days later, he comes by to pick up his body to go up. And while he's picking up his body, just like a typical church, someone, member of the church, stops the pastor while he's on his way to an appointment. He picks up his body. He's going up now. And she stops and goes, she goes, uh, Rabboni. And she's clinging to his feet. And he says, stop holding on to me. I can't go to the next level while you're holding me down here. Let go, Mary, please. I'm busy. Now, go talk to Peter. Go talk to the rest of them. Tell them I'm going to my father and your father, my God and your God. I've done something here you guys don't understand yet. I fused your nature with my nature in a way that's completely unique. Before I was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, but now I purchased the ability to make you as close to the Father as I am. Now you are brothers of mine. The Father is the Father. Of There's a whole new relationship, but I gotta go. I'll be back. Tell him to look for me. He takes off. So he went down before he went up. Well, what did he do when he went down? You want to be asking yourself these questions. They're all biblical. So you go down there, like in the book of Acts, they're preaching about Jesus' resurrection, and they quote the Psalms, and they say, Thou wilt not let thy holy one see corruption, neither will you suffer your holy one to decay. Psalm 16, verse 10, they're quoting. Peter is quoting it on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2 of the book of Acts. You would not let your holy one Decay, meaning you will not let your holy Messiah corrupt in the grave. Neither will you leave his soul in hell. Well, that's a weird thing to say. Why would his soul be in hell? Neither will you leave his soul in hell. Well, what happens is Jesus goes down to a place, but the word hell is really translated Hades. And Hades is two parts. Catch this. There's the bad part and there's the good part. So remember what Jesus said to that thief on the cross? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So if he first descended before he ascended, I always thought paradise was heaven. Paradise wasn't up, it was down. He that first descended, today, on the first day, you'll be with me. I haven't yet ascended on the third day, so you must be with me down there. Down there must be paradise. Now you find something out. There's a good part of paradise and a great gulf separating a good part from a bad part. The good part is called Abraham's bosom or Abraham's chest. Now you start to realize when Jesus was teaching these parables that he was actually talking about stuff like in Luke 16, verse 23, Jesus is talking about the rich man and Lazarus. He's actually not giving a parable. He's probably telling a story. There was a certain rich man, and there was a certain beggar. And let me tell you what happened. The beggar went down to hell. The rich man went to Abraham's bosom. They both went to Hades. Now you find something out. Hades has two compartments. And hell is the bad compartment. Paradise was the good compartment. Why did Jesus have to go down into paradise? Because the way was not yet made open, the Bible says, for them to come into this place up here, which is called third heaven. They weren't yet able to go up into that place. Why? Because the blood of the lamb had not yet been slain. They were the righteous dead waiting for their redeemer. That's why the Bible says Jesus went down to go announce to them, I've done it. I'm here. Are you ready? Let's go. On the way up, he says, hey, let's freak some people out. You, 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 and you. Go through your bodies. Boom, they picked up their bodies and came out the tomb and just like walk like mummies through the city. <laughs> We're all going together. You guys go freak them out. All right, let's go. That's what he did. 
He authorized some of them to go freak people out. They weren't going to believe him. Maybe they'll believe their mother-in-law. <laughs> He's on his way up. Mary's stopping him. He's got an appointment. What's he got to do? He's taking that whole group with him. That's why the Bible says he led captivity captive. He took all the righteous dead that were there and took them with him. Now, if we had time, and I'll probably do this another time, if we had time, I'd tell you what he did. He not only preached over here, okay, let's go, get ready, but uh, I'll be back in a minute. Then he went over here, and he went down. Oh, he went down to the lowest depths. According to Jude and Peter, he went to a place called Tartarus. Tartarus, which is referred to as the bottom of the abyss, where Jude says angels are chained up. Who left their first estate in Genesis chapter 6? Well, what did they do? They left their estate as disembodied spirit beings, took on physical bodies, and went and had sex with the daughters of men and produced a species of hybrid giants. And because they did that, God had to give them a certain kind of judgment that would say, Ho! There's rules in this warfare. I'm going to tell you one right now. You do not leave your angelic body and go into the earth realm. That realm's given to the children of men. And because you guys did that, you specifically are going to be chained right now at the bottom of the pit of hell in a dungeon until I deal with you with everlasting chains. You're not coming. You talk about solitary confinement. They're still there in the dark right now with chains. And all the other angels said, ooh, not going to do that. God said, good. You got the message? That's where I'm taking you. You play that game. You stay in your realm. It's a fair fight. Interesting, huh? So the Bible says Jesus went down to the spirits that were once disobedient in the days of Noah. That's a weird verse. Jesus went down before he ascended to preach. Well, what's he preaching to the spirits that were once disobedient in the days of Noah? Is he preaching so that they could get born again? No. The word preach is the word kerygma. It means it's a proclamation. Sometimes a preaching is persuasion. That's what I'm trying to do. But if God shows up, it's no longer trying to persuade you. It's just decreeing. He decreed over them, I've come. You're officially really done. Bye-bye. Boom. He, there's a weird protocol in the spirit realm. I don't know why God does it that way, but he does it. That's why the Bible says when Michael was disputing over the body of Moses, he did not bring a railing accusation against the devil. It's kind of like there's a protocol. Somehow Jesus had to go proclaim. He, he who ascended to the highest had to physically go to the lowest. I just think God was saying, you're the one species of all human beings in history who will go from the very lowest to the very highest on your resurrection. He went down. He told them, I'm here, and I've come, and it's done. Boom, he comes back up here, picks up these people, has a whole group with him, and while he's going up to heaven, he gets detained by a believer. There's a grave break open here. A bunch of other people come out. They all go up together, and we don't have time to cover this, but I believe that Lucifer, the principalities and powers, tried to resist the ascension. That's why the Bible talks with such great fascination, a doctrine we don't talk about in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus passed through, the word literally means pierced like a sword through the layers of the heavens. When he went up, as he's ascending, he's got this whole crowd with him. The crowd's with him, he's coming up. And as he's going up, this is my final verse revelation for you, and it's wild. It's, uh, I'm gonna go to, uh, oh man, we don't even have time to, to do all this. Now let's go to Hebrews, 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 chapter 9. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Then I'm all done. Hebrews chapter 9, how many of you love the Word of God? The Word of God is a feast. So it says here, and this is crazy. Verse 11, but Christ came. As high priest of the good things to come with a greater, more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all obtaining eternal redemption. Well, we find something out here. That the uh, tabernacle, which had uh, three parts to it, there was the holy of holies. This is where the veil was. 
and this is where the Shekinah glory was. Then you had the place out here which would have like the candlestick and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. Incense, candles, showbread. And then out here in the outer court, out here, you had the, la the laver, which is where they would, uh, priests would wash themselves, and you had a place for the, uh, for the blood sacrifice. Now, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, wrapped in linen, just like he was buried, would go from out there into this compartment and from this compartment into this compartment with blood. Then, according to Leviticus chapter 7, he sprinkled blood in the mercy seat. And then he exited because he was a type of Christ, the high priest. Then we find in Hebrews that this whole structure here actually refers to a different kind of situation where you've got uh, the earth realm here, you've got the second heaven here, and you've got third heaven here, which is where the throne of God is. And, accor and according to Hebrews, this corresponds to that, which makes a lot of sense. This is the physical realm. This realm with candlesticks and incense. This is the realm of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. The bread is for, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The bread and the incense and the candle correspond to the emotions, the mind, and the will. Then you go in here. This is the part of you that got born again, the spirit realm. So these three correspond to these three. Jesus pierces, boom, bam. He hits this realm, takes captivity captive, boom, deals with those principalities. They're now under his authority, and he brings a captive company from uh, Sheol or Hades up from paradise, and they all are there. But here's the part most of us miss. He doesn't go in with the blood of bulls and goats. What does it say here? But it's almost like speaking in the tongues of angels and men. If you don't catch it, you'll skip it. With his own blood. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus with his own blood. I'm going to leave it here. Most of you think the blood was shed. And then it kind of like stayed there, dissolved or whatever. And then spiritually, you could talk about the blood. But the Bible doesn't say that. I can't tell you how they did it, but the same way they, they were able to retrieve the body of Jesus after it was emaciated, destroyed, and made new, the blood was retrieved. Why do I know that? Two reasons. He, the Bible says he went with his own blood. He, because the high priest, what did I say? The high priest goes in here with blood. Jesus took his blood up here and presented it before the Father in the presence of the Father as the price for the redemption of earth. Why do I know it? Because the Bible says, the blood of Abel cries out from the ground. Genesis. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, the blood of Jesus speaks presently a different word. His blood is talking. His blood is speaking mercy, grace. And the blood is at the throne of God. Why do I know that? Because that's where the high priest presented the blood, at the throne. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. But when Jesus comes back, according to Revelation 19 and 20, he comes back with a vestment dipped in blood. Where in the world does the blood come from in heaven if flesh and blood doesn't go there? Before he returns, he takes a vestment, rolls it in the redeemed blood, wraps it around his waist, and then he returns on the triumphant army from heaven with the blood around his waist like a champion belt that a boxer holds up to say, I won, I've earned this. He's coming back with the champion belt. I believe the Bible when it says that he has eyes of the flame of fire. He's coming back on a horse and he's coming back with an army of heaven and his vestment is dipped in blood. I listen to Perry Stone try to explain this. this is all the blood of all the Hamas people he's killing when he comes back. No, this is coming from heaven with blood on the garment. This isn't people blood. This is his blood. His blood isn't defiled with the blood of people. It's his own blood. Where would he get it from? And he went with his own blood. Do you understand that the voice of the blood is calling you to come to the throne of grace right now? 
One time I said, oh, Lord, there are some sins. I think if I was ever committed some of these things, I don't think I could ever be forgiven. The Lord said, never exalt a sin higher than the blood. When you say, oh, God can forgive this. God can't use me. God can't do this. God can't do that. I've gone too far. How dare you exalt yourself like you're so powerful, even the blood of Jesus can't handle you. If you've got a desire to repent, if you wish you could have done your life differently, if you have regrets, that's the invitation to the blood of Jesus because the blood has a voice and the voice is calling you, come to the throne of grace. Come now. Don't wait. Come when you have a need, not when you don't. And I'm telling you, the voice of the blood is there. Jesus comes back to his disciples. He starts eating. You ever wonder why he ate? He wasn't eating because he was hungry. He was eating to give them evidence because they're all just like human beings, like, was that real? Was that real? Was that him? How do you know it was him? I was a hallucination. I think I saw, I saw him right there. He says, you have anything to eat? Yeah, here's some honeycomb, here's some fish. Good. Takes a bite out of the honeycomb, bite out of the fish, talks to them, says, got to go, leaves, and there's the evidence of the half-bit honeycomb with his teeth marks. He left it there to keep layering on layering, saying, you guys have been through trauma. I'm going to try to get you through this thing as best as I can. He breathes on them, says, receive you the Holy Ghost. And still some of them at his resurrection, as he's ascending, the Bible says, and some doubt it. I don't understand human nature, but I'm one of them. Sometimes I behave in ways and I go, if I really believe what I believe, would I be doing this right now? Do I believe I'm dealing with Almighty God, eternity, heaven and hell, and I'm sitting here like, wondering if I should have another glass of wine? Maybe I shouldn't have that other glass of wine. Maybe I should be a teetotaler, legalistic like I used to be, except it doesn't work. But the fear of the Lord is coming back to the church, people. And now I'm going to pray a word for you. I haven't even given half of my message. I just want to let you know. I want you thirsty. I want you hungry. I want you to know there's revelation in here. I'm entering my 40th year of ministry. I just found that out last week. 40 years. Hallelujah. And this book is more alive now than it's ever been before. More alive today than it's ever been. How many of you are willing to pray with the tongues of men and of angels? How many of you are willing to join us in seeing an apostolic church rise up as an ecclesia in Phoenix over Arizona, this county? How many of you are willing to open up this word of God and discover certain things Jesus said to the disciples when he appeared to them? A spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. What did he leave out of that description? Blood. A spirit. You want to know what your resurrection body is built of? It's quantum material. Nick will teach it. Quantum material operating at a higher frequency, but it's made out of a different type of flesh and bone, not blood. The blood is an earth phenomenon. The only blood that's in heaven is the blood that's at the altar of God right now with your name called out. I pray your ears will hear the voice of the blood because the voice of the blood is the spirit of prophecy in the earth. It's the voice of the Holy Ghost. It's the voice of God himself saying, wake up. The hour is late. The king is coming in his glorious beauty. There's a great darkness already descending upon the earth. But for those that are hungry, your hunger will go, cause you to ascend through second heaven, past all the clutter and resistance in the soul, into a realm of revelation up here. I pray in Jesus' name. If there's anyone here that needs to get right with God that doesn't know God, Close your eyes right now. I just want to pray for you. I'm going to sit down. If you need to get right with God, and as I'm praying, you say, well, preacher, all right. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I need, I need to walk with God close like you're talking about. Put your hand up in the air fast. I'm going to pray for you. Preacher, I need that. I need that closeness with God. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, you see the hand up there? I pray an angel tags every one of them. I got angels with me today, people. Tag, you're it. I'm praying for the Holy Ghost to make you a preacher of the Word of God. I'm praying for the Spirit of God to turn you into part of the company that proclaims His resurrection. I pray for you to have such experiences with God that you become one of the evidences of His resurrection. For the rest of you, how many of you want to go to another realm of prayer and get involved with the warfare where angels are actually getting better instructions because they're being prayed properly? They're instructed properly by the intercession of the saints. I pray for these that have their hands up, Lord. Give them the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, which is tongues of fire. I pray for tongues of fire. Fire! 
I'm releasing it to you now. But there's going to come a day when I'm back here at that tent and I'm going to do this altar call. You run up front first because I'm going to lay hands on people during the first day of that event that the tongues of fire is going to be released upon the body of Christ in Phoenix. Tongues of fire is the only thing that's going to remedy the tongues of darkness that are speaking through the wiggling lips of fallen humanity. We're going to burn up what they say with the Word of God. I thank you, Father, for this house. Beautiful church. How many of you want to have revelation in the Word of God? You know who's talking to you now? I'm a descendant, literally, of the Levites. I am a Pentecostal Levite from the tribe of Aaron. I'm a part Ashkenazi Jew coming from the tribe of Levi. I release to you the teaching anointing in this house. Oh, there's nothing more fun than to hang out with the rabbi in heaven and have him teach you the mysteries of the word. Oh, there's layers and revelations and fathoms and depths and treasure hunts like you do not know. Stored up for the last 10, 20, 30 years of history. Books are going to be open that were never opened before. Oh, what a feast this is going to be. It's the feast of the open book, the feast of tabernacles. It's upon us. I release to you the teaching anointing that requires a student to hear the words of the rabbi in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.